So more than two years since doing an in-person talk. Uh, great to see some friendly faces in the room. That's not just the people I know, that's all of you. Um, so this has always been a, a great conference to, uh, to come to, but some very familiar faces as well. So strategies that scale better than process. Now, I could have called this things that scale better than process because it seems like almost everything scales better than process. And it's kind of one of the ironies of the agile world that the thing we try our hardest to scale is what, what is called, is it, process. And we're going to start, we're, we're going, to, going to look at things in a slightly different way, in fact, possibly a radically different way. So just introduce myself, uh, Mike Burrows, author of a bunch of books, uh, founder of Agenda Shift, co-founder of the Agenda Shift Academy, which is a sponsor of this conference, and a little bit about uh, that at the end. But what is the basic issue here? That is, somewhere there's a desire for change, but somehow it's just not happening. There's a few nods already I see. I guess that's familiar, familiar enough. That might not be what you're living at the moment, but most of us have experienced some of that in our, in our careers at, at some point. So let's look at the, the positive side first, that desire for change. Why do, does somebody, somewhere at least, want some change? There could be a number of different reasons for it, a number of different motivations. Innovation, adaptability, responsiveness, the kind of things that we associate with like the outworking of Agile, for example. Or moving more into the internals of Agile, collaboration, sharing, learning. And it might not be just a team thing. That might be, well, perhaps we want to be a learning organization. The one that gets better at developing its understanding of the world, its understanding of what's possible, its understanding of itself, and so on. And there are, then there are more organizational things. Things like alignment, mission, and purpose. Whether that's alignment in sort of the sort of sense of you know, the organs, organization's coherence, uh, something that Greg uh, talked about just before. Or it might be alignment to something new and exciting and specific, a new mission, you know, new sets of customers we're going after, new kinds of project, uh, products that we want to launch, you know, in line with a purpose that perhaps is becoming clearer to us. You know, it, purpose is a pretty stable thing, usually. But, but sometimes there come these, come these moments when we understand it in a different way, and that, again, is new and exciting. So there's a desire for change. And all of these things are very, very reasonable. And these might be things that, you know, you might not have been the originator of the change. You might not even agree with the change that's being talked about, but at least let's agree that these are reasonable motivations for doing something. So from somewhere, there's a desire for change, but it's not happening. And why is that? And there are lots and lots and lots of reasons. I'm going to pick out three. Um, so first of all, people driven to cynicism and disengagement by the repeated failure of imposed solutions. The problem is that organizations, especially the bigger ones and the older ones, they have actually a track record of failure when it comes to change. You know, if one in 10 of their initiatives work, they're doing actually possibly, arguably, quite well. And that leaves scars, and it leaves people to be cynical. I mean, I remember when I used to work in the investment banks. And, uh, you know, every couple of years, two, three years, you'd get a complete radical reorg. Complete and radical in the sense that, you know, one year you'd be product aligned, the next year you'd be customer aligned, the next year you'd be functionally aligned. But most of us would be wondering on the next day of the reorg, well, has anything actually changed? Has anything other than the bonus pool allocation changed? <laughs> That's the, the cynical uh, explanation uh, for that one. Hidden systems reinforcing old behaviours driving the same results. So there's a whole load of things going on here, but sort of just to summarize them, are we being asked, to do, asked by one group of people or one set of systems to do one thing and asked by another to do another, to do the old and the new, and people are caught in a very real bind between the two. So their objectives say one thing, their reward system says something else, and perhaps this new wonderful idea says yet a third thing. That's a pretty uncomfortable position uh, to be in. Innovation failing to flourish, stifled by decisions made at the wrong time, 
by the wrong people. And this can work out in a number of ways, particularly when we're talking about big things with a, you know, the big words like transformation associated with them. You know, some big decisions being made up front. There is some big solution, a framework, for example, that we're going to roll out. And the big decisions have been made already. And now somehow we've got to make it work, we've got to make it fit. Or there are decisions made too late. So the, the innovators are ready to innovate, but they don't have the authority to actually get anything done, something that um, Gabriel touched on uh, this morning. So from somewhere, there's a desire for change, but somehow it's just not happening. If you look again at these, you may realize that these are actually symptoms of traditional change management. You know, you know the kind. Choose a solution, sell the solution, roll the solution out, live with the consequences. I mean, you know, the, the 1990s textbooks didn't describe it in those terms, but that's what actually uh, I think they, they boil down to. And I think that's just a wrong paradigm, starting with a solution, not starting with, uh, you know, starting with a solution, forcing it on people, it's, it's inhumane, it's not, you know, as a way, you know, as a way to like choose into it to roll out your new email system, perfectly fine. As a way to harness people's creativity, people's energy, to get people engaged and so on, it makes no sense whatsoever. And it seems like a distinctly unagile way to do things as well. So there's another layer of dissonance there if you're trying to achieve something, something agile. So there's two things I've learnt about paradigms. And I say paradigms because I think that that way of thinking about change is just completely broken if you're talking about people, social systems, organisations, and so on. The first thing, if it's the wrong paradigm, don't waste your, try, take, waste your time trying to fix it. You know, you're just papering over the cracks. That's the most you can possibly hope to achieve. And the second is not to try to explain the new thing in terms of the old thing. And Agile makes this mistake all the time. That's why I wrote my book, Right to Left, because I was sick and tired of people trying to explain Agile in terms of, product, uh, uh, in terms of projects um, and process and things, and completely missing you know, uh, you know, the kind of things that were celebrated in the Agile Manifesto. And I kind of really felt that we actually needed to start again and find a completely different perspective. When you're talking about a different paradigm, you're talking about a different approach. And if you're going to approach something with a different direction, you're going to start in a different place. So I'm going to start in a different place, and it's going to be a very strange place, and, but it will, it will, it'll, it'll make sense in just a moment. I'm going to start with our mission statement. So this is the agenda shift mission statement. We call it wholehearted. We're kind of describing wholehearted organisations here. Uh, and if, you, if you follow the link there, um, you can understand some of the history of it. So strategy organization development and delivery integrated and integrated is a wonderful word it means made whole well that's one of its meanings made whole through participation the language of outcomes inviting leadership at every level new conversations and new kinds of conversations solutions emerging from the people closest to the problem and credit for that last phrase to the man in the side over there, Carl, who's looking at his phone at the moment. Um, <laughs> solutions emerging from the people closest to the problem. That's where, you know, that's where we start to get the creativity, the innovation, and so on things um, happening. Now, why have I put a mission statement up on the screen when we're trying to get to a paradigm for change? Well, what makes this a useful starting point is a question. What if we put agreement on outcomes ahead of solutions? What if we put agreement on outcomes ahead of solutions? It's not a, a prescription. This is something to try and to keep trying. And I've been trying this now for the past six or so years. This is the question that has driven agenda shift for six years. It's our big what if, if you like. Um, it's not quite enough on its own, though. So keep asking the agreement and outcomes question. That's our principle number one. Principle number two, keep bringing outcomes to the foreground. There's no point agreeing on outcomes 
If the moment you see some shiny new solution, you're distracted by the shiny new solution, and you forget, you forget the outcome. And that happens, again, an awful lot. You know, again, the problem with these big rollout projects is that the rollout becomes the thing, not whatever was the original motivation for uh, the rollout. And keep finding new places to do strategy. Now, this is quite different from the first two, but we're talking about organizations, and organizations are rich and complex environments with many groups of people involved, many networks of people involved, and so on. And if we're going to interact with something as rich and complex as that, we need an approach that can do the same. So keep finding new places to strategy. Um, so we're going to go through these three um, in turn. Um, but four, just to, just to wrap them, actually, just to bring them together, strategies for getting better at strategy. This is what they are. So I thought of these until relatively recently as just like the underlying principles of a gender shift, which, which we describe as an engagement order. How do practitioners, in, in the main, approach the organisations they're trying to help? But a, a dream that I've held for most, most of the past few years is that, well, really, we're talking about leadership, or at least we need leadership to do this well. And then I realized that these are actually great leadership principles. What if we try to put agreements on outcomes before solutions? What if tomorrow we had a conversation about outcomes? What if we kept bringing outcomes to the foreground? What if in our meetings, Outcomes were there, right there in, at the front, before we started talking about the detail of what we were doing. And what if I, as a leader, kept my eyes open for new opportunities to do strategy? And it really is strategy that we're doing. These are strategies for getting better at strategy, so meta-strategies, in other words. Um, and in particular, the kinds of strategy that tends to drive meaningful change, transformation. So principle one, keep asking the agreements and outcomes question and some bullets there authentically in its strategic context. And we really are doing strategic here, strategy here, and organized coherently. I'm just going to very quickly sort of illustrate just one illustration of how this can work. Now, it's an exercise that I've brought to this conference before. Many of you have done, or several of you will have done this exercise before at this conference, perhaps in a workshop. I'm just going to take you through it quickly. So explain it. We we'll start with, you know, in organization development terms, OD terms, this is called a, a generative image. Again, it's not a prescription, it's not a solution, it's something just designed to stimulate some interesting thought. It's our true north statement. Are everyone able to work consistently at their ideal best? Individuals, teams, between teams, across the organization and beyond, Right conversations, right people, best possible moment, needs anticipated, met at just the right time. And yeah, there's a URL there, again, that you can, you can look up. So here's how the little exercise works. So here's the conference version of the exercise, at least. Um, reflect on those words. When that's working at its ideal best for us, what's that like? What's that like? So uh, just to use things people have mentioned today, that's just, we're just painting a picture. We're not designing something, painting a picture, getting in there, getting sort of enjoying it. What's that like? Whose needs would we be meeting? What new stories could they tell? Stories of how things are now, helping people make meaningful progress when previously they would have struggled in some way. S stories. Job stories, in other words. That's a job story for the transformation, if you like. Then what stops that? What gets in the way? What currently is in the way, not just of my true north, my words, but what gets in the way of whatever came to your mind as you were reflecting on those words? So what stops that? What gets in the way? And then let's turn those obstacles into outcomes. Why is that obstacle important? You might recognize that from challenge mapping. What would you like to have happen? You might recognize that from clean language. Uh, then what happens? Then what happens? Then what happens? Once you've got an outcome, then what happens will give you another one, and another one, and another one. And we're beginning to explore this landscape of uh, obstacles and outcomes. The conference version, it's just asking those questions in order. The workshop version, 
is generally people in breakout groups with some resources in front of them will help them ask each other some interesting questions and have an interest, interesting uh, conversation. And there's a pattern here. So the pattern is called the I do pattern. And I do stands for ideal obstacles outcomes. So ideal, envision a compelling future. Obstacles, identify what's in the way of what we want. And outcomes, look beyond to something better. And it's a pattern for doing strategy. And if we're going to do strategy, there's a couple of things we need to get right. So first of all, is make sure we understand the context, understand why we're in this meeting, understand who we represent, understand what the scope of the thing is, and so on. And every time I skip that stage, I regret it. Um, and at the end, organize the strategy. Wouldn't it be a shame if you spent a day discussing strategy and all you came away with were some next steps? Well, doesn't that happen so often? We have a meeting that's supposedly about strategy and all we decide is just one or two things and 95% of the conversation that we've had kind of gets lost, thrown away. So organize the strategy. Now, I've presented it in that linear order. When you get fluent at the language of outcomes, then you learn how to move easily between ideal obstacles and outcomes. Why is that important? That tends to take you in the direction of the ideal, um, for example, for any outcome, we can ask what's in the way of that. So we can go backwards from outcomes to, to obstacle and so on. And it's a pattern and we can just plug some of our favorite tools into the patterns. So we don't start with practice. It's not about, it's not about rolling out practice it's about using some of our favorite tools to help people have some fantastic conversations that will help them articulate what it is they really want and to organize those things into strategy. So that is keep asking the agreements and outcomes question authentically in context and organized. Next one, keep bringing outcomes to the foreground. As I've said, it'd be a shame if you do this, this work, you have your strategy, and then you know, rather than that strategy being something that lives and is about pursuing those outcomes, it becomes about, about doing the rollout. Big shame. And there's another pattern here. It's right to left, title of my book, or one of my books. Um, but that just means working backwards from two key moments. The moment of impact, when an outcome is realized and the moment of learning when you deeply incorporate the learning, all the, all the learning available to you. So um, you may have seen this before, my definition of done, the only definition of done you'll ever need, or at least I thought so. So the only definition of done you'll ever need, someone's need was met. And it implies that you know whose need, what need, how you'd know that you've met the need. And you're covering those kind of things before you talk about the how. Now go back to your everyday feedback opportunities, your um, daily stand-ups, for example, your three amigos meetings. What if before you talked about the detail of the work, you, it was clear to everybody, and if necessary, you made it clear that what we're working towards is someone's need being met and proven, proven to be met. That's different from getting to code complete. That's different from getting to tested. That's getting to making an impact. So I thought this was the only definition of done that I'd ever need, and I realized I actually need another one, so I've got really done. Um, all the available learning fully accounted for. But that's actually, if you know your, your, you know, your, your organization theory, your cybernetics, and all these other kind of things, you actually are uh, uh, double loop learning, OODA loops, all, you know, all these different loops, there's usually two, at least two loops of learning going on. You need your day-to-day -day correction, making sure people are moving in the right direction. And you need that deeper loop where you start to challenge the assumptions that you made. Well, actually, we thought that, but the reality is that. And then the question is, well, what do we do about that? Does it mean our strategy changed? Do we tweak the feature? Was our process wrong? whatever it might be. So all the available learning fully accounted for and you need, people need to know when that's going to happen. If people know when that's going to happen and that it is gonna happen, that changes the way, again, that you think about the work and it changes the way you frame the work. Um, because if you're gonna to get to the meeting 
to the review meeting and the answer to your question is, well, what have you learned in the last month? And the answer is not very much. That's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> so, you know, uh, frame your work so that you're actually going get, to get the learning. So visualizing this a bit, so in Kanban terms uh, or in change band terms as we have here, something's on the right when either it is done, someone's need met, or we know that it failed to be done. If you know your Kanban, you working backwards means, you know, we, we, we checked, is it staying done? And then we look to the stuff that's nearly done. How are we going to be sure that this need has actually been met? And so on, working backwards. So changing the tone of your everyday feedback opportunities, not just your stand-up meeting, not just your board review, not just your scrum, but every everyday feedback opportunity. And then making sure that you're accounting for all the learning and you're set up for maximum, maximum learning before you get there. So that's keep bringing outcomes to the foreground, again with its own pattern, uh, right to left. This time, other patterns as well. There's another one, meaning before metric, measure before method. You know, these, these are ways of um, making sure that we're not overly focused on the numbers, that we're focusing on what we really want to achieve. And we do those again before we start to generate solution ideas. It's actually a, a generative idea. When we start to look at how do we know that we've been successful, that can help you generate solution ideas. And lastly, keep finding new places to do strategy. Anywhere you can amplify purposeful conversations and a sense of self-identity. So we're getting organizational now. So here's a quite traditional hierarchical view of organization. I'm not saying throw this away. I'm saying look at this edge on. If you want to look at it from above, look at, look at it from below, it's the, it's the same. We've now got people of different uh, you know, levels of organization, different levels of experience, different levels of authority in their circles having convers uh, purposeful conversations in the pursuit of whatever it is they are trying to achieve as a group. And it is not just a strict hierarchy. You'll notice that there are people in multiple circles. In fact, people can choose what circles they're in, what multiple circles they're in. They might choose to move between circles. They might choose to join a community of interest or community of practice. Um, for example. Um, but this isn't just hypothetical. This is based on a case study. Um, a lot of my favorite case studies are from my time in, in Government Digital. I was um, interim delivery manager on two of the GDS exemplar projects. Fantastic, fantastic uh, time. So uh, off to the right here, that's you know, a government agency, their digital bit of that government, government agency, our digital service, and then the um, Various, various teams, but intersecting. So there's a UX guy between technology and product, for example, and actually the partnership between technology and product uh, was, was really excellent. Uh, you could call this a, you know, this is where most of the governance happened. Uh, that's me. Not that I'm the boss, I'm, I'm just the delivery manager. Uh, the product owner and service managers uh, belong to the, the higher organization. You know, I was just a humble consultant. Why do I show this picture? Look for new places to do strategy. And you can look at any of these circles, or you could even look at a circle that you know you have to squint really hard to see it, or one that you just really wished was there. And you can ask, is there an opportunity? to develop a sense of identity, a sense of purpose, to develop its own strategy. Now, some of you will think, oh, fantastic, autonomy as teams. Well, that's, isn't, that the, isn't that the agile dream? Some of you are recalling with horror, thinking, oh, no, this is a recipe for um, you know, everyone going off in their different directions. Um, it isn't the latter because of this overlap between the circles. If you look at that circle, most nearly every other member of our team was represented in that circle. And um, there's nothing to stop them when they want to have a strategy conversation to invite 
other people in as well. So there's a great opportunity for leadership here. I mean, um, it doesn't have to be someone senior saying, I think you should develop a strategy and go and, um, while you're at it, make sure you implement a suitable governance process. You know, it might be you exploring with just the colleagues around you, you know, you know what are we doing? Uh, as a, you know, as a team, I know, yeah, I know we've got our work to do, but could we develop our own sense of who we are and how we want to work and actually agree to revisit that from time to time? That's something almost anybody could do. Um, so you know, this, this idea of you know, leadership at every level and leadership not necessarily being a job title, it is, it, it is absolutely true. And I've, you know, I've seen people take the initiative to do these kinds of things, um, you know, in this case study and in others. I've seen people move between circles or to help join circles together and all this stuff. Um, so if you want a fancy name for this, if you want to read, read up on this stuff, um, it it's, uh, goes by various names, circular hierarchy is what Akov called it, but sociocracy is the more common name. But notice how little I've talked about process in this talk or even practice, um, the model, the sociocracy model is beautifully simple. You know, if, if you see a version of, of, of sociocracy, I mean, holacracy is a great example, where it's all about rules and regulations and about how you organize your meetings and so on, that is, you're, you're risking missing the point. I want to encourage anyone who's, who's serious about engaging with organizations to be able to look at an organization, however it is governed, and see people working together, see some purpose, see some interaction, see some opportunities perhaps for collaboration between groups of people that wasn't there before. Again, something that uh, Greg uh, mentioned a few minutes ago. So that's, you can, get, you can have it both. You can have autonomy and coherence. You know, the, the kind of the two things that any, any serious organization needs to have. So that is keep finding new places to do strategy. That's our, those are our strategies for getting better at strategy, and these are things that scale. You can do, at, do these at any scale of organization. I've done all of these literally for the whole organization, the whole organization in a room, a room quite a bit bigger than this, but in a room. Easy to understand how it can work at team level and you know, work with organizations where it's happening at intermediate levels, teams of teams, and so on. There's a whole load of things that scale really well here, things that scale so much better than practice, leadership, participation, and so on. Uh, quite a list here, and I could have added more things. Um, so things, things that scale better than process. Um, you know, if your approach to scaling is to start with process, possibly you've chosen the wrong paradigm. <laughs> um, I, I'm being a little bit harsh there, I think the idea of rolling out a process is the problem, or rolling out a huge heavyweight process is a problem. We need to change our relationships, relationship to frameworks. Um, I had a, a paper published on InfoQ on Friday, actually, on that very topic. Well, that's the, that's the key finding of the paper. We need to change our relationship to the framework such, such that we can treat them as useful resources, but get away from thinking that our job is to roll them out. I will tweet it to the conference hashtag um, after, I'm, after I'm finished, if you want to pick that one up. Just to finish, uh, first of all, if any German speakers in the room, there is one, good. Right, I'm trying to, get, I, have, um, I have at home, I have a box, of, I was given a box of 20 proof copies of the um, new German translation of the Agenda Shift book. Um, I don't speak German. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm giving them away. I've, um, so. Do take, do take, do come up to the front and, and take one afterwards. And lastly, in your conference bag, you've got a card. So you're, there's a, a discount code there which expires on June the 15th, it says, and that will give you 30% off at the Agenda Shift Academy, and it applies to all our subscriptions. So it will save you a bit on an individual subscription, which is a, you know, a, a, a not an expensive thing, even right up to our biggest corporate prescription, uh, subscription, you can use that same um, discount code. So do take advantage of that. Um, what we're trying to do now, 
you know, I, you may have understood agenda shift in the last few years as being something very focused on practitioners. We really are going after leaders, leaders in transforming organizations. And if that's something you're, you're interested in, then give it a look. So I'm done. Thank you very much for listening. It's great to be back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions. Are we done? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can. We can do questions if there are any. Yeah. Just a really quick one. Uh, you mentioned that you know, we also need to change our relationship with the process. Where we talk about scaling, right? Yes. That we go process forward. Do you also think we need to change our reward system of how we deal with process in the, in the sense that? People, um, quote unquote, sometimes coaches, we are rewarded for pushing the process first. Yes. So, do we need to change, uh, in your opinion, that relationship with how we are rewarded for interacting with that process? Do you know, I haven't actually thought too hard about how consultants are rewarded. Um, <laughs> you know, in terms of the grand scheme of organizational challenges, um, it's probably not the biggest, but I think if if organizations and in particular their leaders are thinking the right way of transformation, then I hope they wouldn't do, wouldn't do that. Um, whether it's the biggest problem, I think, is something else. Um, but again, there's one of those, it's, it's an incoherent thing again, isn't it? We're wanting innovation, but we're rewarding conformance. We're wanting outcomes, but we're rewarding outputs. You know, so um, you've now got your consultant caught in one of those same, same kinds of binds. There's, there's a dissonance there, an incoherence there, um, and that is a symptom of probably a bigger incoherence. You know, the idea that this rollout is going to solve everything for us, when we know actually it's going to be a world of pain, it's going to take us a long time, and the result is uncertain, and the world is going to ch ch to move on in the meanwhile. You know, um, you're setting yourself up for, for some difficulty. I'm not saying it's guaranteed to go wrong, but it's not a low-risk way of doing it. But it's, I think people buy these solutions as a low It's an easy decision to make, is to buy a solution. Yeah. Was it? Did you have a hand up for it? Yeah. Yeah. As, as I listen to you, it's one thing came that the the phenomenon of moving from what you described to a process seems to be accompanied with desensitization in a way, and formalization and desensitization. So how do you, how would you, once something is formalized, keep the life into it? Yes, I, that's, that's, I think that's why strategy number two here is so important. We kind of, uh, it's, we, uh, it's, it's natural, it's normal, it's human to be focused on our work and for those of us who have been taught to think in process, and I'm one of them, you know, it's also, and it's natural for us to think about, you know, why, is, why are things like that? Couldn't we do it better? And so on. And forget what it is, again, what we're trying to achieve. And keeping outcomes in the foreground is, I think, a way, but like desensitization is an interesting word. Yeah, but be less sensitive to the how and more sensitive to the why and the what. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to say start with why, because that's a whole new conference talk, but yeah. Um, we need to have agreement on outcomes, and that needs to be authentic, and we need to have some conversations about that. And sometimes those are difficult conversations and roundabout conversations. Um, just asking why a few times probably isn't going to cut it. Um, anyway, whole separate talk. <laughs> yeah, one at the back. Yes. Especially because I'm Spanish, and in Spanish we don't have these words. Yes. So it's, it's uh, stupid, but it's no, it's not. It's, yeah, it's, it's a classic problem for a gender shift. Actually, you know, we have to translate some of our materials, yeah. and uh, I think in uh, the, the, the Swedish gender shift community have argued for a long time about what what words they should use. Effect, I think, is the word they end, ended up uh, going and, with. Yeah. And it's something. It's like a, a journey because we have some people, early adopters, that fully understand what it's an outcome. Yes. Yes. The other side that don't understand that. And yes. We have, as a company, it's not easy to, yeah. to change from this perspective of uh, outputs. Yes. To so two. I often re respond to these things with a question to ask. So, and you've seen both of them already, actually. So, if given a solution, 
or an output, you can ask, why is that important? Because what we want are things that are meaningful. So 10% more kind of is an outcome, but it's not very meaningful to most of us. So 10%, 10 more, why is that important? And the other question to ask is then what happens? So then what happens is a very useful question for flipping a solution into a, an outcome. So, OK, we make 10% more, then what happens? Um, and, uh, and it works with sort of small solution things as well as, uh, as, well as large solution things, both, both of them. Yeah. Fred again. Just because of what the example you took, yeah. how do you... A lot of people have been imposed the outcomes that we may yes. talk about. Yes. How do you accompany people in the journey of, yeah. oh, should I start? Yes. Well, I'll give, you, I'll give you the long version of authentically. So authentic agreement on outcomes means the right people in the room agreeing on things that matter to them, are meaningful to them, articulating the kinds of outcomes that they're going to want to organise around and find solutions. Yeah. That's different to imposing an outcome from above, quite clearly. Yes. So yeah, it's, it's a lot. I've, got, I've attached a lot to that word authentically. Um, but it's, yeah, that's an important one. Yeah. Who's invited? That's a really critical thing. Some of those circles, if you, if you know how to read that diagram, there were, th there were three at least levels of seniority, even in just those little circles. And my top tip for bringing people together for an interesting conversation is make sure at least three levels of organisation are represented. Uh, and there's some very good reasons why that is. You know, you need people with authority, you need people with knowledge. If you understand a thing, you need to understand its context and the detail. You know, that three thing gets, keeps coming up um, and very useful um, little trick. Yeah. Should probably, oh, well, one more question and then, we'll, then we will stop. Yeah. I was just going to say, we're seeing quite a bit people drifting back towards process. Yes. Um, I think because they are, one well, of the main reasons is, oh, this person, this person don't work well together. Yes. So we need to create this boundary. Yeah. Uh, sort of combined with um, ne not necessarily having clear out outcomes. Yes. Um, bit, bit of an NDA culture. Yes. Fantastic. Are they sort of the key drivers you see in, in sort of driving people back towards that process? Are there any other sort of key drivers that we should be looking out for as well as those? Well, putting people together can be a, 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 a valid tactic. But ultimately, um, you know, to, to successfully do the, you know, if we go back to the, the circles picture, um, the principle of consent is one of the principles. Um, people consent to be in those circles. They joined by consent. The people whose circle they're joining consents to have them, and so on. Um, so some relevant books here. I mean, uh, Greg mentioned um, team topologies. Another one that goes really well with that is dynamic reteaming. Uh, by Heidi Helfand, um, that again is about how do we create an environment where people can actually move and you create not just flexibility in the organisation but also developmental opportunities for people, people as well. Yeah, Really should stop here, that was, but uh, thank you very much for your questions. <laughs> <laughs>